Greetings, Guardians. We're back at it again, because apparently, um, the promise that we made about the next thing being Telesto was not in fact true, and it was something else that has caused a monumental explosion of destiny drama, and so myself and the lovely Sir Mylan Games are back at it. Again, talking about everything surrounding that drama, but not about the drama itself. Yeah, Matt, we, it's we, so good to be back we are here, milking destiny drama without talking about the drama and just talking about the law of <laughs> said items which is uh, i i, I want to call it eager edge but that's actually not that's the perk name yeah it's, it's actually uh half truth or well actually it's other the other half really isn't it the, it's, the purple it's, it's both of it's both of them it, it both rolls them. on both i believe but either way it it's this it's basically the same item in, the, in law terms, at least it is. Well, yeah, and, there's and a whole bunch of law surrounding this, which we're going to cover, which is super interesting. And I didn't really cover a whole bunch on my channel when it first came out. I don't know if you covered much about no. the uh, Dares of Eternity, Star Horse. Uh, Honestly, it kind of flew under my radar, given the uh, time of year that it was in and how slow that part of the season of The Lost was. Mm -hmm. But... It's really fascinating stuff. Yeah, you're 100% correct. Like, I, I, I sit there and put it up there with the other strange lore that has come out of the Nine, where it's just like, okay, if you really want to talk about Nine lore, you go really big picture, and you, you forget about the micro scale, even though hilariously yeah. they do get down to that micro scale. You need to talk about big concepts when you talk about the Nine. Yeah, yeah, and... If we're lucky, I think you're going to talk a bit about Halo lore too, right? <laughs> mm, <laughs> Which I know like, nothing about. I discovered Halo in my 30s on stream, and I do believe it is the best game ever made, and I get the fandom now. But mm -hmm. I, I I, refuse to look at lore about Halo because I wanted to play the game, <laughs> not read about it. Yeah, and it gets to that point where you, you sit there and it's like... If I, you know what, this is the same reason why I find it very hard to justify pouring time into Final Fantasy XIV. Uh, because I sit there and the moment someone tells me about how great the story is, I'm like, mm -mm -mm. compulsive me is going to sit there and be like, no, I need to digest all of this. And then suddenly I, I, I don't have time to do my job and I am just covering lore on things. And I'm sure that would be great for people, but I don't know how easy it would be to transition to an FF14 lore journal. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. we're not doing that but halo law absolutely fantastic stuff awesome. I, awesome. I grew up with that so i i know a bit here and there i'm certainly no halo canon i'm certainly no uh uh yeah. hidden xperia yeah. any of those guys will do a video on this stuff yeah and look, far better and, than i would so, and yeah. that sort of goes to this video as well with destiny law there's, there's likely going to be some mistakes here and there we're, we're we're having a casual conversation about the law i've i've got some notes and that kind of thing but you know just keep that in mind when you're <laughs> typing aggressively into the comments if something is incorrect. Just, you know, let us know nicely. That's, a, you know, it's always nice. I can't believe that you did not refer to it as the Type 1 Energy Sword, Bife. <laughs> this is unacceptable. And frankly, that is so important for the sake of understanding the canon and where it has come from. <laughs> and I don't believe that you could possibly make a video like this Very anymore. nice. That was a good one. <laughs> Oh, okay, oh. Wait, wait, where should we start? Should we start with like the general Dares of Eternity Paraverse conversation and then get to the actual item itself? Yeah, I think so. I, I think so. The the briefest of introductions that I will say is that for people who don't know uh, somehow and who have clicked on this video mysteriously, Eager Edge is what we're discussing. It's a perk that rolls specifically on those two swords that we mentioned earlier, the other half and half truths. And uh, when it really comes down to that, it's all stuff that has come from the Dares of Eternity activity, which is all centered around the Nine. Yeah, uh, which was part of really the Bungie's yeah. 30th anniversary pack, which is sort of mm -hmm. important too, which we'll, we'll sort of get to that as well. Oh yeah, and it's yeah. chock full of references, which, I, you know, we're going to touch mainly on Halo for this, but I think it's fair to say that lots of the references that Bungie threw in there uh, they date back to games and concepts and things that genuinely do bridge across all of their different franchises. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's not just little hints like the items. Even some of the concepts of things like the Paraverse have very kind of almost marathony flavor to them. If you know anything about the way that uh, Marathon Infinity 
and its story kind of unfolds, mm -hmm. which is, th that's a rabbit hole I'm going to touch on briefly if it comes up, but we are not diving into that. That's a, <laughs> that's like a, that's a 45 minute video talking about things no one understands. So that is not something we're going to do today. I literally have <laughs> similar notes that saying there's too much here to discuss and that's the only <laughs> note I have. <laughs> oh, so, Zer Ugh. summons us to Dares of Eternity and he is a, he's running this game show with a new character, Star Horse. And uh, Zer strangely has to obey Star Horse and Star Horse seems to be the boss with the infinite nays in this scenario, which likely has significance. I think we'll slowly get there. But Dares of Eternity is described as uh a, a place between realities and it's where paraverses converge what's your thoughts on paraverses five <laughs> so a paraverse is like a universe except it's kind of a discount universe no um this is i when it comes down to it a lot of this gets explained in the uh forerunner exotic quest yeah uh, and in particular, it's that last ending note of the quest, which is just a bit of text. And it's basically Zer stating that all of these different imagined universes that we have from Bungie, it kind of get crushed up together uh, within Dares of Eternity. And uh, the paraverses are therefore coming together and providing us with these unique items and therefore unique boons that the Nine have been able to fish out of these alternate realities. Yeah. So it, that's it, kind of, yeah. It sort of adds canon, Bungie saying the multi, this is the type of multiverse in Destiny. And I mm. guess the implication is when you put it all together is the other games that Bungie made are essentially other universes that exist. And mm -hmm. that's where this loot is coming from. When you get these weapons that exist in the other games, like the Halo Energy Sword, like the uh the magnum from you know uh, master chief's magnum or or a magnum that spartans use that well, the, it is the, it has been thrown cleaver from myth and all that yeah yeah that it that it's coming through uh this paraverse or this convergence point and that's how we're picking it up so pretty like big law that was dropped very casually in like a 30th anniversary pack <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's just kind of, you, you sort of dropped one of those. Again, it's that nine thing. You take something where you have a interaction with the nine. It could even be, relatively speaking, kind of a casual interaction by most measures. And you just kind of drop these massive bombshells, you know? It's like, hey, you know, you sat there and you played this activity that's tied to Gambit Prime, except it's PvE. By the way, the law tells you that the Nine are sentient dark matter and that they are basically <laughs> tied to our existence and are trying to escape it. And there's two different warring factions within. Have fun with that, you know? It's, it, it's a, one of those massive revelations that just drops out of nowhere. But... I, I think, I, and this is kind of the point where we'll touch on it, I'm not wrong when I sit there and say that this is a concept that Bungie has played with throughout many of their games yeah, a right. lot. Right. Yeah. So the really quick uh, rant that goes on about that, to summarize it briefly, states that there are elements of the lore that you can connect with Pathways Out of Darkness and the Marathon games. Uh, and a bunch of other things here and there, which basically tie everything together and imply to us that these different universes are connected. And even the Mida mini tool, which I did not realize at the time being, because yeah, I needed to brush up on my marathon lore at the time being. Yeah, even the Mida mini tool and its lore makes references to those universes being joined, uh, because Mida is very much a part of the marathon lore to do with Mars. I, I can't remember exactly what it stands for. I think it's Mars. Uh, Martian independence something something but yeah the whole point being this idea of these converging universes and converging timelines and uh, paraverses as the term has been called is very much something that Bungie has played with throughout all of its games over those 30 years so codifying that in Destiny where their lore is more fleshed out than any of their other universes by factor of volume it makes sense and it really does help to sort of I, it, it makes everything a series of pillars under this 
wide foundation of stuff, you know, and it provides that sort of wide justification to say oh, these universes are separate, but they are very much linked by these different points in time. Yeah. How, a similar topic or, you know, alongside this topic, Sabathun breaking out of the game and tweets. Because I think mm. you made a video about this, right? Like, how serious do we take? Was it Sabathun that took over the Twitter? Is that what happened? Uh, or was it yeah, I mean, there's been, there's, there's been two. It's been both. Uh, Sabathun took over at the launch of Witch Queen and Keitel took over during the season of The Chosen. But, like, Sabathun breaking out 100% plays along with this concept, too. Because there's been, you know, there's been other um, times in which the Nine have done this whole fourth wall breaking thing too. Like the Nine, Savathun and Ahamkara are all in this unique cadre of beings that very much twist and break that fourth wall and, uh, and deliberately hint at the idea of like our real world might be one of those paraverses yeah, too, yeah, you know? Yeah, that's, I, it, that's sort of confirmed in Dares of Eternity that our world is part of the paraverse because that all the game show references are all game shows yeah. <laughs> from our world, right? That's yeah, hundred like, percent. Wait a second, how is you know Zerg quoting these game shows? That must mean that we are also part of the paraverse. What do you mean, spin the wheels? Uh, what do you? What? What am I getting here? <laughs> how much are you paying me? Oh, you're paying me in vex. Oh, that's a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good mm -hmm. lord. Um, so yeah, no. Another. So, do you know much about the, the cryopod that we see in the Forerunner mm. quest? Is that actually from... Does that link into a Halo game? Is it a cryopod lost? And then, like, that's so, it there? It's, I can't remember if there are specific bits and pieces with the quest, but the common assumption that you get from that is that that is a reference to Halo 1, just as the Magnum is, or Halo CE, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, so in Halo CE, you start the game uh, in a cryopod, and you know you have the big opening cutscene where they sort of go through the situation the Pillar of Autumn is going through, and then uh, it gets to the point where Captain Keys sits there and states, you know, wake up everybody, everybody, which of course is a, a reference to you. And you get this little cinematic of yourself as Master Chief stepping out of a pod that looks exactly like that. Mm. Um, and you know, the first weapon you get is Key's Magnum. So having that cryopod open just a little bit and then being able to retrieve the Magnum from it makes a lot of sense. You know, it's a direct and uh, I'd say very on the nose reference to Halo CE and the way that you start that game, you're starting Arsenal and how everything unfolds from there. Yeah, and it's it's pretty nice the lore tab for Forerunner because it it talks about how huge the Magnum is and like not even a Titan could hold it. So it's like poking fun <laughs> of like I guess how big Spartans are in comparison to to Guardians. Um, I don't know I the lore to... of that. Like it's Spartans seven foot or something oh, like that. They're quite huge, right? Yeah, Spartans are something. They're they're easily seven foot. I think I, I can't remember if it's like seven foot six. But there's also, I think, fun references there to talking about how the Magnum feels way too powerful for what it is and way of attuned. Oh yeah, because um, of the because that's the whole bug, right, with the Magnum. Oh, so the the I don't know if this is true or not because it's it's fallen into that category of internet myth, uh, and I don't know. If, so so someone I'm sure in the comments will correct me if I am incorrect. But uh, the rumor has it that. Um, as Bungie was getting ready to ship yeah. Halo CE, I've heard this, yeah. Jason Jones or someone else who was attached to the project really quickly jumped into the code and made the Magnum super strong so yeah. that it could three shot someone in PvP in Halo CE and just made it this monster, which is why it's a special ammo sidearm and why it has that three tap ability yeah. here in Destiny. You know, and it's just, it spawned this legendary reputation of like, hey, I'm holding a Death Star in my hands. So the whole <laughs> yeah, overtuned yeah, yeah. bit in the lore is why that makes so much perfect yep. sense yep. as well. Like, yeah, they're totally playing into their own like history and canon with that. Whether that myth about Jason Jones doing that or not is true, I have no clue. I heard the Someone, same thing. I'm sure so I, I, yeah, this is something we'll correct us. I had I heard the same thing when I was playing Halo. I was I was, I was told the same story by by chat. Um, the interesting thing, I, I think we should talk about Star Horse now. Mm. Cause 
Star Horse is central to the Paraverse. I've actually got a little uh, quote here, which I didn't have before until I made some notes on, on this. And it says this, These days of eternity are not truly real. They are a Paraversal reminder. And when the impossible horse leaves us and the realities realign, they will disappear forever. It will be though, as though they never existed. The paraversal space runs thick with illusion, but the power you take from from here is real. Um, interesting that Star Horse is like central to this plane of existence, this reality existing with all these uh, different universes converging on it. And this sort of <clears throat> leads into another quote that Star Horse, the, the horse whose flowing mane encompasses all timelines. Now, I had a theory, and I don't know what you think about this and whether you had the same idea, but my interpretation is Star Horse is Bungie. And it ex Bungie exists with all the timelines. That's why its main flows through all the timelines. And without Bungie, you don't get to see all these different universes. And they are the, and that's why Star Horse is in control of Xur, and that's why Star Horse is one of the, the game show hosts. Um, and this was like a nod because it's the 30th anniversary, you know, Star Horse Bungie brought us this little care package, little thank you notes uh, from them for playing their games. Mm. What do you I think? honestly, that's a phenomenal theory, and I'd not thought of that. I will sit here and say, not only does that make great sense from the perspective of what Star Horse is going to be, uh, but testament, I, 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 yeah, testament to you for coming up with something that actually pulls together that stuff that is breaking the fourth wall with all of this because stuff like that is where I tend to sort of lose it because my brain separates it from the rest of the stuff because I'm like okay fourth wall breaky stuff is over here but no that yeah. makes phenomenal amounts of sense you know and it's also way better as far as all the other theory is concerned compared to what we had before which is that you know, the horse also appears in the Trials of the Nine at the very end if oh, you're able yeah. to succeed there. I was there, never able to like on the emblem. put that into something. I never came away with a theory about why that horse is. Yeah, like the best I ever had was something to do with the Horsehead Nebula and yeah. there was no good reason to assume anything else, but there was also nothing that related to that because yeah. that's a far off cluster of stars. That's something that realistically does not have any bearing on destiny as best we know. It has never been brought up. It's never been mentioned. That's just all we knew is just mm. horse. Yeah. That's it. The, 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 I guess the other way you can interpret Star Horse is that it's somehow one of the nine and, and that would, that would, I guess, support that the, the other Star Horse in, um, in, in, uh, in Trials of the Nine. Yeah, in Trials of the Nine, yeah. Um, but there is quotes. I don't have them in front of me. There are quotes that quite sort of heavily imply that Star Horse is separate from the Nine, the way they talk about it. And that's why Zer's, it's really odd that Zer has to take orders from Star Horse. And I do have a very <laughs> cynical... I don't think this is true, but it's very, it's 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 fun to think about. If, if Star Horse is Bungie, then in this metaphor... Zer is the developers, right? So, and, and so <laughs> Zer is oh. at the will of Bungie. They have to go his through. His will is not his the, own. Yeah, oh. his will is on his wow. own. Um, and he, he says, you know, I'm I'm summoned here by the impossible being, Starlight, the shape of Star Wars. The horse guides my every word. It demands you leave no trace. Like it's, you know, uh, Zer is forced to give us loot, and sometimes the devs probably don't like us. They don't want to give us loot, but the big bungee <laughs> overlords like, you know what? <laughs> Got to keep the players coming back to play Dares of Eternity. We are a team, Star Horse and Zer. We keep the players coming back. We give them loot. So that's how this business works. <laughs> Fun enough. Oh. Yeah, no, that's a honestly the <laughs> looking at it like that is hilarious, and yeah. it does make sense then for it to be the 30th anniversary celebration because they are very much putting on that celebration. You know, yeah. they are hosting it for you and they for are, your they enjoyment. Are. Yeah, so. and there's uh, I do have some quotes here, but it, it basically says that that this Dares of Eternity is for you. This is a gift for you. This was designed for you. This loot is for you. So that sort of like feeds into the theory that Star Horses. Bungie, and this is all part of their like gift to the players. And I've got some like other cute quotes here, which is like Star Horse like loves you. You know, Bungie's always trying to be <laughs> part of their like community and 
and that you know that love their community and player base. Probably not yeah. recently. <laughs> so if Dares of Eternity goes away, that means the uh, <laughs> the theory is correct. Like, no, we're gonna take this present away from you. Be naughty. Fine. No more BR red frames for you. How good is the BXR? Have you got a red oh. red border? It is my guy. The yeah. the I have not actually finished my red borders for it, but the first roll I ever got back in the original loot pool for it was a beautifully rolled perpetual motion kill clip, and that oh, thing has carried we've me. We've got it. So lovely. Yeah. It's oh, mm. mm -hmm. it's real good. So yeah, I uh, I have enjoyed my time with the BXR quite a lot. That's that's what the notes I had on Paraverse and the Star Horse itself. We can probably talk about the 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 half truths unless you've got um. Anything else you want to add about the Paraverse and Star Wars and Zer? Nah, I, I think Half Truths is uh, it, yeah, we can we can we can jump into that. And uh, I think it's if we're gonna start with that, I think the important thing to remember is that Half Truths and the other half uh, are kind of two halves of one weapon. Surprisingly enough, given that they both have halves in their name, and that weapon is meant to be the energy sword from Halo. The note of Hearth Truths in itself as a name for the more common blue one, which actually is the color scheme that you would see on a typical energy sword, uh, yeah, that actually does potentially have a Halo lore kind of reference in itself, and that is to do with the Prophet of Truth. Oh, okay, who, okay, tell me so, more. <laughs> uh, a few, so a few, a few bits and pieces here. There are some spoilers for Halo type stuff. Basically, Hearth Truths are uh, it, or rather, saying the name of the sword is Half Truths is very important because the Prophet of Truth, ironically enough, is constantly telling lies throughout the entirety of Halo. Him and the other two prophets, uh, who were at the center of the Covenant hierarchy at that point, knew that they were essentially lying to the rest of the Covenant about the nature of the Great Journey, which is their central spiritual belief. It's this belief that if they activate all the Halo Arrays, they will ascend and join the Forerunners in Godhood. That's not what actually happens. The Halo Arrays cleanse all life from the galaxy. So you have these three uh... megalomaniacs setting the entirety of a massive uh, alien theocracy on a path to total annihilation across the galaxy, which is it's scary enough in itself, but the fact that they knew about this is what makes that so terrifying. You know, like they very deliberately hid notes about this and the reality of what it could mean from the rest of the Covenant. You know, they wanted to ensure that uh, everything was intact there. I really hope I'm getting those notes of law correct. If someone does correct me in the comments, go ahead and upvote that. Uh, the yeah. other reason why it's interesting that uh, it's Half Truths is the name of the sword is because, lo and behold, in Halo 3, near the end, not the final mission, but in my opinion the best mission, the mission called the Covenant, you see the Arbiter, one of the characters, kill Truth. He does it with his energy sword. So yeah, you, oh. you have a nice little tie in there, you know? Half Truths is playing with a few different threads that make sense for the energy sword. And then but, the perk yeah. and at, on question, uh, for this Twitter drama, Eager Edge, you know, is uh, a callback to sword flying, right? In Oh, it, yeah. In Halo 2? So, Halo 2, yeah. So, uh, that was the unique interaction where basically you could aim down sights with a weapon, and then if you very quickly did a certain interaction by pulling out your sword and swinging, you would essentially be able to fly at breakneck speed yeah. with that sword. Yeah. Which is why it operates on that note of the moment you pull your sword out and then swing with a melee, right. it gives you that big boost of speed because that's how the mechanic works. Just in the same way that with the actual BXR, um, as in the rifle that you get from Dares of Eternity, the pulse rifle, yep. the actual name BXR and blunt execution rounds, the perk, the way that functions is a reference to the BXR, which was a technique in Halo 2 where basically if you went ahead and used it correctly in the correct sequence, it would operate much in the same way as the perk does in Destiny now. So all of these mechanics are actually references to what essentially were glitches within Halo 2, which really just nice ended up being yeah. yeah, which ended up being gameplay features. And if you've seen those Halo 2 speedruns, you almost certainly have seen people using the sword flight and have seen people who have been making use of that to traverse huge maps with basically zero effort whilst making it an unbelievably fast run and 
hitting all those key checkpoints and killing any key enemies they needed to. I mean, <laughs> watching one of the... Go and find one on YouTube, because watching one of those is actually really kind of impressive. Yeah. But the, uh, yeah, it doesn't end there, though, because energy oh, swords in themselves... Yeah, they have... Oh, you got standard energy sword lord now as well, right? Oh, yeah, 100%. Okay, because I mean... Yeah, so... Uh, the other half and the half-truths are, of course, mimicking energy swords, and they have a huge amount of lore. Now, granted, some of this was developed by Bungie, some of it's developed by the later team at 343 with Halo, but essentially, let's cover some key ideas. First of all, swords, as they are in Halo, were developed by a race called the Sangheili, otherwise known as the Elites, you know? They're basically the equivalent of what I think the fair analogue in Destiny terms for them is the Fallen. Because the you know, amount you of times of, I called them Elixney yeah. when I played Halo is insane. <laughs> and yeah, you know, like they even fulfill that same kind of role. You know, they have this elegance and alacrity to them, whilst also potentially being very deadly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, they're, they're filled with that finesse that really speaks to both races. And I think if you not only compare them as an analog, but also if you look at the way that, you know, different enemies will actually wield swords in both sides of those races, you know, you'll see that you never see a drag with a sword, just like you never see a minor elite with a sword. You, generally speaking, will see those on captains or marauders at the very worst. And so when you take a look at the elites in Halo, it's very much replicated, but that's actually expanded on a lot in their culture. You see, civilians for the elites are not typically allowed to use swords in an elite's society. Only really high-ranking governors and officials are okay. able to use them in civilian lines. In the military, they are also allowed to be used more freely, but certainly not by your typical, I say grunts. I don't mean that as in the species. I mean that more as in, uh, you know, your very typical minor elite. Right. So just your run-of-the-mill soldier isn't going to get an energy sword. They have huge ceremonial significance. And so generally speaking, you'll see them wielded by, say, the generals and the shipmasters and yeah. ultra rank elites and elites that have special fulfilled needs as say infiltration units they have certain special assassin units that have energy mm. swords and so they are really special but there's it goes even further because the elites have references in their society to this thing called the swordsman genes which is basically Ooh. a way of saying you have lots of skill with the energy sword. And here's how crazy this gets. If you are a swordsman in Sangheili society, mm -hmm. you are not allowed to marry. But because up until more recent times in the time of Halo 5, predominantly speaking, the military role was a patriarchal one. If you were a swordsman, though you couldn't get married, you could mate with any female you chose, regardless of whether they were married or not, specifically to carry on the swordsman genes. And that's how incredible that kind of like prevalence of the sword actually falls in their society, you know? It's one of the more important parts wow. of their society is preserving that culture. And, you know, this is something that very much gets broken down later when the Covenant starts to get dissolved and when the elites have more of a freedom over their own society and when the Arbiter starts leading them. But yeah, that just is gives there, you an is idea. Is there any specific law around was. the ones that uh, go invis? Ooh, the stealthy ones? No, yeah. I think it's more to, I think it's more to do with their rank. But I think right. that the uh, really cool thing about that is that when you have elites that go stealth with a sword, their rank sometimes means that their sword can be different. So I think the best example of this is one we see in Halo Infinite. I cannot remember the name of the elite. But you see that elite who has that crimson sword. Oh, and that's yeah. That's really yeah. terrifying and unique. And those kind of like blood blades are very much a sign of an elite unit like that. Was there any. Elite, was yeah. there only Halo Infinite that changed? To, look, I'm just going to piff questions at you about Halo, but if you don't know the answer, then, you know, whatever. Uh, Go for it. Uh, is it. Was it only Halo Infinite that had like a different colored energy sword, or were there other colors in previous Halos? Were they all blue? <laughs> Uh, so there are other colors, but there's, uh, like, as far as the others being red, I believe that in the Halo 2 Anniversary Collection, there was a Blood Blade. I can't remember if that's the Halo 2 originally had that as well, but I don't think it did. 
Um, having said that, in the lore, there are other kinds and colors of blades because the blades are all manufactured with a great degree of care. So, oh, I was going to ask you this: how they're made? Mm. Is yeah, lore so, on their crafting. Uh, some lore on not exactly the nature of their crafting, but more kind of like the regime behind it. Uh, I'm going to look at this name real quick because I've got the page open on the side. Uh, but yeah, quick. Uh, Chikost or Quikost is the name of the place where the energy swords are made. And they're made by a group called the Merchants of uh, Quikost. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but I'm going to run with it. Essentially, they are operating on the moon of Sanghelios, which is the elite's homeworld. Right. And so they are the crafters that created energy swords even way back in the day and have really expanded that craft as they've gone on. The actual construction of them is very important and ceremonial, and so you're not going to see them all over the place in comparison to other weapons, like say a plasma rifle. But the thing is that the energy sword, as you could expect, is a cultural relic of the elites, the Sangheili, and it really comes from a series of different weapons that were developed over time. So originally, you had these kind of twin blades you would wield on Sanghelios before they had any of this advanced technology, which was just wooden steel, and that was known as a curved blade. And it looks kind of like, well, to be honest, it looks a little bit like the other half, or half-truths, which is really mm. interesting. You know, it's that kind of half thing. Yeah. The handle is the only bit that's a bit different because we hold it at the very base. It would have held it closer to where the curved bit of the blade is. But then later on, eventually, there was a kind of middle step between this archaic wooden weapon and the energy sword that the Covenant would learn to use, which was called the Burn Blade. And that doesn't use projected plasma like an energy sword does, but it does use uh, a step up as far as technology is concerned. I'm going to go ahead and read this bit uh, super quickly, because this is the bit that is way in deep in the technical weeds. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the Burn Blade. Here we are. Burnblade is a Sanghili sword common to the Covenant's early history. It was manufactured by Sanghili living on Sanghelios' uh, moon. Burnblades are forged in metal and heated within to devastating temperatures that would then damage targets. So you have this kind of iteration of different technologies. You know, you go from just steel to superheated steel to actual superheated plasma. And this is the next bit of the weapon is just how it works because realistically oh, yeah. the plasma sword itself is not actually the blades that you see the blue bit which is the most iconic bit isn't actually the sword the sword is just the little dongly w that you see <laughs> and when you, you know like if you actually hold it about like you're basically punching about with what is a very ineffective kind of brass knuckle that's not even a brass knuckle because you mm. you'd hold it like this with elites like finger structures it's a little bit oh, different right because they can make that kind of claw motion a lot more easily than a human could. But when you actually sit down and look at it, the construction is just an energy projector that projects the actual plasma blade, and then a magnetic containment field, which gives it its shape. And the mm. blade doesn't cut in a traditional sense. It's just really hot plasma. It just so burns it you. burns through. Like, this, this has devastating consequences, you know? Plasma can cut through steel on starships in Halo. So if you had an elite with the correct boarding gear, it's not inconceivable that they could just cut through, slice through a ship's hull, and then vent a portion of the ship, you know? Like, these things are not at all inconceivable. This feels like a tool that the Elixir would want for, like, docking arms, you know? Like, cauterizes oh, yeah. a womb, like, chop, a, ch chop a Dreg's arm off, <laughs> demote, demote some captains. <laughs> oh yeah, and and the cool thing about it as well is that it's it's really designed with a greater degree of fatality in mind, you know? The entire idea of an energy sword is not only the fact that you're, you know, projecting this thing that's burning hot, but it's also what happens when you think about specifically sticking a hot bit of plasma inside in certain wounds within a human body. You know, you're looking at something which will immediately shut down and just massacre internal organs. Blood will boil, it will most likely kill major organs that are there immediately. It may get so hot that certain other organs burst, as it says in the oh, Halo articles. This, yeah, no, this is the stuff I was reading this morning. Was, oh, wow. 
all of this stuff. It's grizzly, man. Like, and it's, wait, it's good against energy shields too, right? Like the whole thing, isn't it? Isn't it? It's good against, like, I guess, shielded opponents. Yeah, it's. I mean, you know, it can cut through the shields of a Spartan, and it can uh, then cut through the armor underneath in a single swing. So it is powerful against that. As far as whether it is more effective or not, I am unsure because right. it's one of those moments at which, you know, the power of shields within Halo is very variable. So some shields are unbelievably strong and can probably tank one or two of them. I don't know if that's something that is reflected in the lore as it is within game, but I can tell you that if you swing at certain elite enemies on legendary difficulty in most of the games, if you're looking at a top tier enemy, there's not always a guarantee they'll die in one hit to that sword. Mm. So yeah, no, there, there is room for it to be effective against shields, but it's often shields that have a great counter to it, you know, shields and staying really far away from it. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think the really other, the other neat thing as well is just the way that it makes you fight, you know, most swords, you are using it in your arm and it's going at a right angle, you know, yeah. but the sword itself in Halo, it's more of a stabbing, stabbing. motion, yeah, yeah, yeah. but is done by a punch. And it means that you're elevating your arm to use all of your reach. And more importantly, it's, I think it's, when you really think about it, potentially a little bit more intuitive to teach from no, like, base knowledge whatsoever. You know, Just like, like, here, have this punch stuff. Titans! Yeah, basically. Titans would love it. hundred <laughs> percent. I mean, you know, if you've ever sat there and looked at, like, the claws on the end of Ursa Furiosa, um... Uh, the Titan exotic yeah. and been like, yeah, I want to just punch people with that. That's kind of the same idea behind what an energy sword does. You're basically just stabbing people yeah. with that nonsense. And it's it's much less about just the individual swipes across, but it's much more about that thing of like, hey, if I need to reach and really quickly skewer an opponent, I can absolutely do Which, that. Which, to be honest, sort of makes sense because if you had like a plasma blade, and you were like hacking and slashing, that actually wouldn't be very effective because you just like cauterize the wounds, right? Whereas, as you were saying before, if you stab it into them and their like, blood boils and their organs pop, like, <laughs> success. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah. And there's, uh, I, can't, I can't remember if this is true. A Halo law junkie somewhere out there will also be able to correct me. There's all sorts of things about plasma toxin also getting into the bloodstream after being hit by an energy sword. I need to have someone correct me on that because that's right. something I couldn't find on Halopedia, so, but I seem to remember it from somewhere. Is you know? there a purple? There's not a purple. There's not a purple energy sword in Halo, is there? It's variable, and the blades are kind of unique, so it's not impossible. Yeah. But the key example of all of this actually comes from. Uh, energy swords like the one that the Arbiter uses, which is Prophet's Bane. That itself is not purple, but it shows us that you can actually alter the aesthetic oh, of a, right. uh, a sword. So that one in itself is not red, it's this kind of orange and yellow. Uh, and the shape of the blade too is very different. So it's not impossible that a purple one exists out there. It may also be, and maybe I'm misremembering it, it might be something to do with the coloration on the blades back in Halo 1. I feel like I'm wrong about this, but maybe looking back and comparing Halo 1, or sorry, Halo CE versus Halo 2 and Halo 3, the Halo CE blades were a little bit closer to purple. I think I am wrong about that, but mm. it's worth looking back because that's the game that had the most aesthetic differences. Because I made, I made a note yeah. here about the, the other half, which is, you know, the, the purple version that you get in Destiny. And how well, you know, the, the pun is like half truth is, is one side and the other half is the other half, half. Um, but also, I made a note that I wonder whether it's, you know, Cortana's famously purplish, purple hue. Uh. Like, I wonder if that, that's the other half of, like, uh, Master Chief. Hmm, I hadn't thought of that, but I mean, yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, I, yeah, I really didn't think about that. Hmm. Yeah, I, you know, that, that might make a degree of sense, to be honest. And with the way that it is incredibly rare as well, you know, it reflects the rarity of Cortana as a being, as an AI, because she is basically, at the time of her creation, she's like the most advanced AI that the UNSC has ever created, uh, specifically built partly from Halsey's own DNA. And I think if the campaign of Halo Reach is indicating this, and if I'm remembering correctly, also built with some Forerunner technology. So 
you know, like the entirety of it is basically just sitting there and hinting at this idea of, yeah, this other half to your hero is very rare. So mm -hmm. maybe that does make sense. I haven't really thought about that. I've got a couple other notes. If I mean, we've gone for a little bit, that's what you, we've hit 40 minutes by the dog. Blimey! <laughs> Uh, I did have a couple other notes about the other weapons and what universes they're from, but I think I'm happy to call it there, unless you've got some other things you want to uh, chat about, or unless you want to go into them. Uh, nah, I would just say, you know, this is my this is my commandment to everybody who doesn't want to get soaked up in drama. Go and look up the story of Marathon. Like, all three games. Marathon, Marathon Durandal, and Marathon Infinity, and go deep go deep into the point at which you sit there and you figure out what the hell's going on with the working carpenter Wait, can, can i google marathon law and find stuff or not there is a site out there that has oh my god who, <laughs> there is uh, listen a, there who is, a... is the bife of marathon <laughs> i don't want to read bife i want to listen there's a there's i there's a site i believe that has been speculating about marathon law for about 20 years <laughs> right like, let's put it this way. Marathon Durandal was released in 95. There are still... Th there are still blog posts talking potentially about the story of Marathon on some sites out there and speculating about what it might be. You know, like... So much detail has been thrown at that game. And especially when you get to the confusing stuff when it comes to in in Infinity. Oh man, that <laughs> you you want to talk about throwing the kitchen sinks worth of theories at someone? Uh, yeah, let get there and just scratch the surface and understand how crazy that is, and then you'll potentially see how special all the stuff to do with the paraverses in Des of Eternity really is, because that's the kind of stuff where it's really calling back to them. You know, by the point at which you sit there and you're like, oh god, which timeline was this in? Then you're starting to understand, which, it, yeah. In my, in my opinion, sitting there and working through that was one of those really cool, like, oh my god, I've unearthed a secret treasure from ages and ages ago kind of moments that you want to get if you're really into the lore. So if you're super into it, go and look out for that. Find that somewhere out in the net. It's there, I promise. You know what would be interesting? And I, someone, I, someone told me this. I don't know if it's a Twitch chat or a YouTube comment that a dev confirmed there's there's a there's an easter egg in the in destiny that hints at the new ip have you heard that no i hadn't but i wouldn't be i wouldn't be surprised well if yeah that's this, true, this is they, like the whole theme right yeah. it fits into like the paraverse and because there was hints about uh destiny, destiny in, in halo was it, odst was it odst yeah, whatever you they, know they, yeah. didn't they take it out once three four three yeah, 343 three took it out and replaced it with the generic new Mombasa advertising. But yeah, it was always there in Halo 3 ODST yeah. ever since 2000 and, yeah, 2008. And oh my God, it was just staring at us for four years before any of that even got announced. Yeah, there, there, there's some, there's an Easter egg out there somewhere, chat. Go find it. Mm -hmm. Go find somewhere it. Somewhere it exists and we just right. need to figure out where it is. Well, so that there you go. Uh, this episode was brought to you by destiny twitter drama which started all about eager's edge on the alo sword that you can get from des of eternity and we've just told you all the law that you can uh not all of the law but a yeah, pretty good summary on the paraverse and the uh half truths and other other half hope you've enjoyed mm. uh if you'd like to check out my name is bife of you might be watching this my name is bife in that case look in the description you find a link to my channel if you're on my channel look in the description you find a link to bife's channel and uh we'll mm -hmm. see you next we'll see you next time <laughs> next twitter destiny drama <laughs> Actually, what's what what's the when do you need gonna it? be when on you next need, time when, when do you need a time off because these, these, these videos are fun when do you need a couple weeks oh three weeks gosh time? i mm, yeah let's 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 wait two weeks and we'll see it happen again and i bet it'll be a thing i'm not gonna say it's gonna be telesto this time i'm gonna i'm i'm gonna sit there and say it's gonna be something something else i don't know what but it won't be telesto well, that's gonna be my bet that's the, gonna be my bet the patch notes um oh the the twob today had so many they're gonna like touch 20 exotics or something so Ooh, we might yeah. have a whole exotic series <laughs> <laughs> Oh, all right you want to sign gonna, us off this 
Oh, absolutely. This is this is I, I I'm I'm loving the fact that this is one of those moments at which we have created content. I don't know. That's like genuinely <laughs> we we we've we've taken something wild and out there and we've manifested it. That feels great. Um but yeah, no, as as uh as Mylan said, go ahead and check out both our channels. If you're watching on each of uh our channels, go ahead and check the other one out and drop a subscription and go ahead and like the respective video. But as per usual, thank you so much for watching and know that your viewership is quite enough for us. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife, and this lovely gentleman on my, I think it's left on the video, <laughs> is uh, Mylan Games. And uh, thank you very much for watching. Rodasi Astro. we will see you starside. Thanks.